John, and the New Testament, John's Gospel, and chapter 11. John's Gospel, and chapter 11. I think I said last week before we started reading, uh, we read from John chapter 9. I said that when you go home last Sunday, go and read the whole of John chapter 9. I'm not sure how many of you did that, but I would commend you to do the same this week. Uh, Go home today, uh, read through the whole of John chapter 11, because all of John chapter 11 is building up to this point, which we we will read from, from verse 38 to verse 44. And so that's where we'll break into our reading this morning from God's Word. John chapter 11, verses 38 to 44. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. For he has been dead for four days. This is Lazarus. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and his feet were bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Father God, as we come before you this morning, as we have read these words of Jesus bringing life to a dead man, would you bring life to us this morning? Would you build us up in the life that you have already given us? But if there's uh, one who hasn't received your life yet, would you give, give them life? Or whether, this, whether they listen to this online or not, be with us, Lord. We thank you that you promise to always be with us when we gather to, uh, to worship you. And we pray, Lord God, that by the Spirit who first inspired these words to be spoken and written, would you teach us? We long for your teaching this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Something happened last Sunday morning uh, that actually brings a lot of uh, unhope, the opposite of hope to a lot of people, but is actually something that is very hopeful. Especially, it, 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 brings, uh, it brings dread to parents, especially, uh, as the clocks go forward an hour, uh, because we know, as parents, we're going to get an hour less sleep. But the wonderful thing about the clocks going forward is that at the time of year when the clocks go forward, we know it's springtime. And springtime is a time of year that, that brings a, an awful lot of people an awful lot of hope. Why? Well, the clocks go forward, so there's an extra hour of daylight. The, 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 there's signs of life around us as, as the flowers bud, as the flowers come to, to fruition, as they come to bear fruit. The weather as well, come the springtime, as we leave winter, the weather is, is getting better, better, it's getting warmer. Uh, there's, there's, as, as I said already, there's, there's that little bit more sunshine. And all these things bring just, I think, a little bit more hope into to people's lives. But we come to a story this morning that should point us to the ultimate hope that we can have. If you'll allow me a little bit of poetic license, this is the the message of springtime in the life of a Christian. So we've come to our final sign this morning. We've been going through our series of, of the sign miracles that Jesus performed as he was on earth. And we've come to our final sign this morning in our series, looking at these signs that point to Christ. And really, we've been building up to this sign. We've been building up to this miracle all along the way. 
Jesus, uh, so far in the previous six signs, he has been proving that, that he is the, the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that he is the one sent from God himself to accomplish a great work for his people. Jesus has been proven that he is the Messiah by bringing light to those who are in darkness, by healing those who are sick, by providing food for those who are hungry, and providing peace in a troubled sea. And he's been doing all these things to show that, that he is God himself, come in the flesh. He is the incarnate God, come in the flesh for a purpose. And John records these things that, that we may be drawn closer to him. That we may be drawn closer to him. And that all who see the significance of these signs would find life in his name. You see, folks, we haven't gone through this series of signs just because it's a series of nice stories for us to focus on. We've gone through this series of signs because it is through this, these works of Christ that John points us to the, the, the abundance and the fullness of life that is found in Christ and in Christ alone. And I wonder this morning, I'll ask at the very outset, have you found this life? Whether you're here in person or you join online now or a little bit later, have you found this life that is available in Christ and in Christ alone? And I ask this this morning because as we come to, uh, to this sign miracle this morning, it's literally a matter of life and death. As we come to Jesus raising this man from the dead, it is literally a matter of, of life and death for Lazarus, a friend of Jesus, is lying dead the life's gone from his body. He's lying dead in a tomb. Now, there's a, there's a finality about death, isn't there? As we face death as human beings in this world, there's a, there's a finality about death. There's a, a hopelessness attached to death. There's a grieving process involved in death. You see, the reason there is a death seems so final to, to us as humans, the reason it seems so hopeless to us as humans is because death is the enemy of the human person. Death is the enemy of the human person. And so the first thing that we see in this story, we have, I have three focuses this morning. And the first focus that we'll, we'll think on is, is the problem of death. Now, this isn't all going to be about death this morning. So don't be thinking that. But the first thing that we must notice from this account that we have read is, is the problem of death. Death is a problem. It's an enemy to the human person. And it's so much an enemy that when faced with death, Jesus weeps. If you cast your eye back to chapter 11, verse 35, you'll see that very famous verse, the shortest verse in the whole of Scripture. Jesus wept. When confronted with this de the death of his friend, Jesus wept. Although Jesus is not necessarily weeping here for Lazarus. Why? Jesus knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knows what's about to happen in the next little while. Jesus is not weeping for Lazarus, for he knows he's going to raise him from the dead. Jesus is shedding tears here because of the brokenness of the world, because of sin, and because death exists at all. And in the brokenness of this world, he knows even at this point in the Gospel of John, even at this point in his life and ministry, in the brokenness of this world and because of sin, Jesus knows that he himself must die. He must face death. That's what we remembered this past Friday on, on Good Friday. Jesus faced death for us. Jesus, who would here raise Lazarus from the dead, was sent himself to die. That was his whole mission. That was his whole purpose, that he would come and die. Why? Because we're told in the book of Romans that the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. 
And here we read that Lazarus has died, not necessarily because of any personal sin in his own life, but certainly and ultimately because of the result of sin entering the world way back in the book of Genesis, way back at the beginning. Lazarus has died. Now, he dies four days before uh, Jesus comes to, to, to see his tomb. He, he, he has died four days before this, this account here in uh, verses 38 to 44 happens. Lazarus has been dead for four days at this point. His, his life has left his body. His body has been laid in the tomb, and this tomb was sealed with a stone, a heavy stone, a giant stone. And Jesus, in coming to the tomb, he, he orders that the stone is, is rolled away. And Martha, if you'll see in the story, Martha seems to object to this. She comes to Jesus and she says, uh, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. He's going to smell. He's going to stink. I think in the King James Version, it actually says, Lord, by this time he stinketh. He stinketh with the stench of death and decay. But Jesus coming to the tomb, he, he orders the stone to be rolled away. And, and Martha here objects because of this decay that will have set in. But Martha may have been worried about something else as well. You see, in Jewish tradition, uh, they held that the soul of a person hovered over the body for three days after death. But by the fourth day, the body started to decay, and the soul, when, they, when, when it's seen the body starting to decay, the soul then departed. And so may, Martha, sorry, may have been worried that, uh, about that as well. By the fourth day, the soul would have left. And this, this may be one of the reasons why Jesus actually performed this miracle, to break that superstition and to show that he is powerful. He is greater than any superstition. He is greater than any tradition. He has the greatest power that has ever existed. Nevertheless, Martha's words are words of hopelessness and despair. It's too late. It's too late. By this time, his, his body is, will be stinking. It's, it's too late, Lord. Just leave him there in the tomb. Just leave him. Don't let, don't let everyone who is around about, don't let everyone who is seeing this going on, don't let them see him in the condition that he is going to be in. It's too late, Lord. It's impossible, is the sentiments of Martha. But Jesus' response to her in verse 40 is, is really a gentle challenge. Jesus says to Martha in verse 40, as she raises this objection, Jesus says to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Jesus says here what he's, what he's saying to paraphrase with this gentle challenge to her unbelief is that, Martha, you're focusing on the things of earth. You're focusing on the things of earth. You're focusing on what is impossible. You're not focusing on the one who breaks the power of impossibility. The one who can do the impossible. Jesus is saying God's glory will be seen by those who have faith in him. She's looking at the situation, Martha. She's looking at the situation through human eyes, not heavenly eyes. And that's, that's really understandable to an extent, isn't it? Well, she is human after all. And we are human after all. It's very easy at times to look at a situation from a, a humanly perspective. I, I think it's very human to look at situations from a human perspective and, and feel hopeless, feel the impossible nature of the things that are faced. But I think Jesus' response here is an indication to both Martha and to us that whatever goes on in this world, whatever goes on in our lives, Whatever goes on in our personal lives, God is to be trusted because he is in control. God is to be trusted because he is in control. Folks, we have spent a year surrounded by the, the, the thought of death. 
And it would be very easy for us to focus on that and to get caught up in that. But I think what Jesus would say to us is lift your eyes above that and see the glory of the one who is in control of all that is happening. And maybe that's a word for so, that some of us need to hear this morning. When hope is lost, when the road ahead of us or the road that we're currently on seems impossible, we must look to God in faith and see what he is doing. We must look to God in faith and see what he is doing. But the question then arises, how do we trust God when everything seems so hard, when we're facing something that seems impossible? How do we trust God when hope seems to be gone? Well, I think we must look at what he has already done. We must look at what he has already done. That's the whole point of these signs. That's the whole point of the study we've been doing for the past seven weeks. That's the whole point of Scripture, or one of the purposes of Scripture. As I've already said, these things that we've been studying, they, they aren't just nice stories for us to, to think about each Sunday. These things are the evidences that God has done what is impossible in human eyes in the past. And he is the, still the same God who can do what is impossible in human eyes in the present and in the future. And so in those times of life that seem hard and seem impossible, we don't look at God. We don't look at these things with blind eyes, hopeless eyes. No. We look at these things and we can, sorry, look at these things. With, the eye, with eyes that have been opened, spiritual eyes that have been opened by the Holy Spirit to see all that God has done in the past so that we can know that he is active in the present and in control of the future. I wonder, do we know that this morning? I wonder, can we see that no matter how impossible situations face, God is in control. He's in charge. Nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing is too hard for him. You see, even at the most difficult times in life, even as we face the hardest things we face, through belief in Christ, we too can see God's glory. As Jesus said to Martha here, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? We too can see the glory of God, even in the darkest of times, even when our faith is shaken. We can cry out, as the disciples did many times, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. The problem of death seemed impossible to Martha, but the conquering of death was but a, a word for Christ. As he proclaims life, and that's our second focus for this morning. First, we've seen the problem of death, the result of sin. But next, we see the, the proclamation of life. Jesus prays here and uh, starting to pray in, in verse 41. He lifts up his eyes and he prays to his father. And he thanks his father for hearing his prayer. Jesus wants the people who are around about. He wants the people who are there watching what is going to happen. He wants these people to know that this miracle, this sign can be performed only because God is in charge. Only because God is there, only because God is at work, and only because God will speak to the dead and speak words of life. Jesus wants God to receive the glory that he deserves and the honor that he deserves and he wants the people to know that he is sent by this all-powerful God to do these things. And then after Jesus prays, after he prays, he shouts, Lazarus, come out! And he does. Simple as that. He says, Lazarus, come out. And he does. The dead raise again, rise again at the very word of Christ. Lazarus came out of the tomb from where his lifeless body lay. He came out at the word of the Lord. 
He came out of his own physical strength. No one had to help him come out. That lifeless body that lay in the tomb just moments ago came out full of life again. But he only came out by the power of God. He only came out by the power of God. You see, folks, the hopelessness of death is only experienced by those who do not know and cannot see the power of God displayed in Christ. Do you know the power of God this morning? As you sit in this room, as you join online, maybe as you join later, do you know the power of God displayed in Christ? Paul writes to the Thessalonians that, that, that he doesn't want the, the Thessalonian Christians, those who know Christ, Paul writes to them that, that he doesn't want them to grieve as those who do not have Christ grieve. Folks, God, in the face of death, he doesn't want us to grieve as those who have no hope. That's one of the points of this story. He doesn't want us to grieve as those who have no hope. For as the hymn writer puts it, and, and, and the hymn that we'll share in and sing at the end, in Christ alone, our hope is found. Not in anything in this world, not in anything else of that nature. Only in Christ is our hope found. And folks, if we're looking for hope in anything else, we're looking in the wrong place. We're looking in the wrong place. But folks, as well, as this morning as I preach on Jesus' miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, I feel that I would be neglecting to do my job if I did not point out that this resurrection of Lazarus by the word of Christ points us to a greater resurrection, the greatest resurrection that could happen in us. And on this Easter Sunday morning, it is through this greater resurrection and the death that preceded it, which we see the glory of God. Lo, in the grave he lay. Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord. Everyone knows the words of this old hymn. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes, over our foes of sin and death. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints. You and I who know him to reign Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Lazarus, he comes out of the tomb and he is still wrapped in the garments of death. He is still bearing the garments of death. You see, Lazarus, he, he will die again. He will die again. Some of the Jews in John chapter 12, you can go. Some of the Jews will even try to kill him. They'll even try to put him to death. But Jesus Christ emerged from the tomb bearing no but garments of death. He emerged from the tomb bearing no burial garments. His body, we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, his body was raised from the dead, spiritual, imperishable, and glorious. Jesus Christ died once for sinners, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. But what does the resurrection of Christ mean for us? What does the resurrection of Christ mean for us on this Easter Sunday morning, 2021? Well, in the same vein as encouraging everyone to read a little bit more of Scripture after the service, let me encourage you as I, as I seek very briefly to answer that question, what does Jesus' resurrection mean for us? As you go home today, read 1 Corinthians 15. Soak in the glory of that chapter of Scripture that is written by Paul and read what exactly what Jesus Christ's resurrection means for us. But to summarize, let me try and hopefully not fail, but my finite words will never do justice to the glory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reality of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead secures for the believer the resurrection to eternal, imperishable, glorious life with God. That is why for us believers, 
Death is not hopeless. Death is not final. Death does not have the last word in our lives. Why? Because Christ rose from the dead, and because Christ rose from the dead, so will all who believe in him to glory, to presence with God for all eternity. The power of death has been defeated for the believer, and the proof is this. The cross is empty. The tomb is empty. And Christ lives to, to intercede for us. Jesus Christ himself says in Revelation 1.18, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. If you're a believer this morning, I can do no more and no better than to draw you to, uh, to remember the death and the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and glory in that. Praise the Lord for that this morning. P please do. Praise the Lord for all he did on the cross and, and coming out of the tomb. Praise God for that this morning. Jesus' resurrection secures a, raising, a resurrection for us. And unless Christ returns uh, for us beforehand, we will all pass away. But for the Christian, as I said already, that is not final. It is not hopeless. Death is a defeated enemy swallowed up in the victory of Christ over death. Let me read to you what a very famous evangelist, D.L. Moody, once said about death. Maybe some of you will know this already. D.L. Moody uh, lived in Chicago uh, in a place called East Northfield. And he said this, Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher. Yes, that is all. Out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. Death for the Christian is but a doorway into the very presence of our Savior. So we have the, had the problem of death. We've had the, the proclamation of life from Christ and raising, uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. And on the last day, raising us from the dead too. And finally, let's finish with another thing that this story of Lazarus points us to, and that is that Lazarus lying in the tomb is a picture of the lost. It's a, he's a picture of those who do not know Jesus Christ. People without Christ are helplessly and hopelessly captive in the tomb of sin. Helplessly and hopelessly captive in the tomb of sin. I've already read from Paul that the wages of sin is death, both physical and spiritual. Ephesians 2 points this out to us. You who were dead in, the tre in your trespasses and sin, Paul says. You see, folks, if we focus on Lazarus, we are meant to see that there is no life without Christ. There is no life without Christ, but this Jesus Christ raising Lazarus from the dead is a, is a picture of the lost being called to life in Christ. It's a picture of the lost being called to life in Christ. You see, our God is powerful. Our God speaks, and our God speaks to the dead. He speaks life. He speaks life. And maybe today you can see your hopelessness and your helplessness as you listen to this. Maybe today you can see that hopelessness and helplessness of being captive in the tomb of sin. Well, through this message, through this story of Lazarus, God is saying to you, come out. Come out of the death which, which sin ultimately leads to. Come out of the death which sin causes. 
Jesus says earlier in this chapter, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. I wonder if you're listening to this, will you hear God's call? Will you hear God's call to life in Christ right now? You see, the point here is that without Christ, without Christ, Lazarus would have remained in the grave. He would have remained in the tomb. But because of Christ, he was brought back to life. If you don't know Christ today, would you hear his call to come out of that place of spiritual death and separation from God? And would you come to him? Come to him and receive this life. John's whole purpose in recording these signs was that the, in verse, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Oh, would you find life in the name of Christ today? And where you experience that freedom of, from the video at the start. Freedom from the, death, the power of death and the power of sin. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for this story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And we thank you, Lord God, that this isn't just a nice story for us to focus on on a resurrection morning, but this is a story that points us to true life, which is found only in you. So, Father God, open each and every one of our eyes this morning. Open those who believe in you. Open our eyes to see the glory of Christ fuller, more complete. And Father God, for those who do not know Christ, may they hear your voice calling them to come and experience that life for the first time. Help us, Lord, to re reflect and respond and praise to what we have just studied by singing in Christ alone. Our hope is found. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.